In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Dr. Stenstray Gunderson, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of South Carolina. Sten is a blood flow restriction training expert, and we discuss the application of blood flow restriction, how the BFR cuff used may impact the exercise stimulus, and so much more. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. And I'm very excited to be here today to talk with Dr. Stenstray Gunderson, who is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of South Carolina. Um, I'm very interested in seeing what we discuss today because uh, Sten is also published in the BFR space, exercise physiologist, and is just generally interested in blood flow restriction, but we may have uh, some very similar, maybe divergent opinions on the application of BFR. And as this is the BFR Better for Results podcast today, we are actually going to talk about blood flow restriction. And so welcome to the podcast and uh, thank you again for your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Nick. You know, uh, I've been following you for quite some time now and I just, you know, appreciate all the the advertisement of blood flow restriction in general. I think it's, it is a powerful tool um, and a way to tap into the kind of existing mechanisms of exercise. And, uh, uh, you know, I think you've been a big advocate for, for its use in a variety of contexts. So, you know, really excited to be on here. Well, thanks for, for that. It really means a lot. I, at the end of the day, um, BFR is a tool uh, that can help clients and patients get back to the activities that they love quicker than other approaches. And so that's kind of how I've fallen in love with BFR. I've seen the the results personally, professionally, and um, as a researcher, um, seeing the results that we're getting. And it's just really exciting. And I think yeah. the the excitement continues to build as evidenced by all these different projects that are coming out, the ways in which people are investigating BFR, the ways in which they're applying BFR, it's it's really uh it's really exciting time to to be in BFR. And um, you know, for 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 that, what got you interested in BFR, your journey toward yeah. um, towards your academic, uh, your academic endeavors, kind of fill us in. Yeah, and uh, you know, just before I get into that, I, I will say it is a really cool time to be in BFR. Um, you know, I've heard you say this before, but you know, ten years ago, when you know, a little bit longer than that, when I first got introduced to it, it was this gimmicky thing that was sort of, you know, especially by strength conditioning coaches, was like, ah, you're better off lifting, and like, there's nothing to that. And and to sort of see the explosion in the last ten years within the kind of Western world or United States uh, has been really encouraging, and uh, you know, a very um, uh, Cool, cool to be on the on the end and see that development over the years. Um, so with that being said, my first kind of exposure to it was while I was playing soccer in college. Um, and my my dad had actually been approached by Katsu. Um, he he you knows had a lot of experience with uh, elite athletes and uh, was sort of the the authority when it came to uh, altitude training, living high and training low. Um, and so you know he was always kind of looking for ways to maximize performance in a legal and ethical way. Um, and so that's kind of what uh, was the impetus behind Live High, Train Low is how do we how do we target these hemological changes and these improvements in performance um, with you know nature or the environment rather than these exogenous drugs or PEDs. And um, and so that's kind of that was the impetus there. So he was approached by Katsu originally was very skeptical, uh, kind of used his kids as a little bit of guinea pigs and, uh, and you know, showed us the, the costume master and that really cool, almost bomb looking type of uh, suitcase looking thing. Uh, we were all really, really intrigued by it, uh, but also very skeptical, like, you know, obviously trust, trusted uh, his, his experience and his, and his expertise, but we're also like, you know, is it, is there really something to this? This seems a little, little strange, a little gimmicky. Um, and then I, you know, I, I started kind of, Titrating it into my training, um, particularly, you know, after a resistance training session that we'd have with the team, 
Um, I also would just do kind of a, a, a non-negotiable. So like after a soccer practice, I would just do like three sets of 30 uh, bodyweight squats and then three sets of 30 pushups to kind of top off that session. And I did notice, um, you know, weirdly, I noticed a little bit of an increase in power and plyometric adaptations. It seemed seemed like I was a little bit more resilient to um, to fatigue, um, you know, particularly like one, one example I have very very uh, visceral was um, I played outside back. So you make a lot of runs up and down the field. And, you know, particularly in that final third of, of the attack, you really need to be very um, uh, uh, specific and precise with your movements and your passes and your touch. And I noticed that after I started implementing this for about a month, that my precision in that final third, when I would otherwise be fatigued, was actually really sharp. Um, and, and that was sort of the first kind of, oh, ha aha, moment of, okay, there might be something to this, adding that extra volume could have been, could have been a factor there. Um, and then I started seeing it and kind of, as my friends kind of saw a little bit of those, those benefits or what have you started getting interested in it. And one friend in particular who, who hadn't really prioritized strength training or plyometric training, um, all that much started using it. And he, he really developed as an athlete. I mean, he just became a more explosive, a more agile, just a better looking athlete on the field. Um, so those were sort of the first kind of, you know, trickles of little information, bits of information that started getting me down. Like, okay, there, there actually might be something to this, you know, tease apart, maybe the addition of the extra volume, like, is it the fatigue? What's, what's going on? Um, that feeling, that feeling that you get towards the end of that set uh, is similar to, it's actually in my mind, it's more similar to like running a 400 meter dash than it is to actually lifting a heavy weight or something like that. So it's like, how is this exactly working kind of piqued my interest. I was studying physiology and biology at the time. So it was all kind of like coming together. And then um, kind of just continue that training, started using it more and more on different, on my teammates. And then uh, kind of, actually it was kind of funny. They, they, uh, they, we were using Katsu at the time and, and the thing was like, oh yeah, the, the Katsu master uh, is, is, is trying to restrict our blood flow. So I kind of, that was kind of a little bit of my identity on the team to an extent. So that was kind of cool. And then I, uh, so I had it, ended up trying to pursue professional soccer in the USL. I actually had a pretty bad concussion, uh, my, like my graduating senior year of my, of college. And so I had to kind of wait a year to, to go again, tryouts are, or preseasons in like January, February, March period. And so that following year I was trying out, um, was competitive, uh, at the, at a USL team, didn't end up making that, that squad. And so in between teams, I was just kind of trying to stay fit, trying to keep my touch. Um, it was in a men's rec league and uh, someone who probably shouldn't have been out there uh, ha had a really late challenge on me. And as I kicked the ball, he came in a uh, double footed tackle and hit my fit, my foot. So this, it was kind of like, I was kicking the ball like this. I got to the ball first. He, he came in right after, and it really just opened up my knee, um, ended up with a grade three MCL tear, uh, a PCL grade one, and then a meniscus injury as well. And so first of all, on top of it being painful, you know, people, people, you know, tear the, their ACL or something like that. And it's like, oh, all I felt was a pop and it like, wasn't that bad. This, this was not one of those. This was like mm -hmm. my knee just like opened up and it was terrible. Uh, never had any knee injuries prior to that. So, um, and it was pretty, pretty severe injury, a lot of trauma, uh, got up that night. I did, was doing cycles of, of, in this case, it was Katsu kind of doing a, a hybrid of be strong in Katsu. And, uh, and within, you know, I actually saw the ortho, he's like, you're on the borderline of needing surgery, not, um, but you know, we have this full modality plus, uh, anti-gravity treadmill. So let's just do this aggressive rehab protocol and not in elect not to do surgery. Um, and so I did that and it I was, this is really where it was like, holy crap, there might be something to this, especially from a healing standpoint. Um, I was pretty mobile at day 21. Uh, like I have a picture where it was like getting like 120 degree knee flexion at day 21, which is pretty good. I mean, you probably know more than, more than I do about this. Uh, and then by six weeks, I was running at full body weight, eight weeks, I was able to cut and pass. Uh, you know, I wasn't able to, I still felt it, particularly in my meniscus. I still felt sort of that like stiff MCL feeling. Uh, but the, the ability to which I could be functional and, and actually play soccer again was, was really good. Now this was kind of all moot because 
uh, the, the preseason was over. The season has kind of already started by the time I was able to get back in, in that eight weeks, but um, still wanted to see kind of how fast we could, we could attack this thing. Um, you know, and just in the record, there were no peptides involved at this time. There were no, there were no exogenous anything going on. And so, uh, you know, we really wanted to get at like, does this prescription of BFR plus anti-gravity treadmill, treadmill walking and running, does that accelerate healing to, to the degree to which we, we think it does. Um, and so this, this was really the, the start of my sort of like looking at this from not just a performance standpoint, not even just from a PT or rehab standpoint, but what's going on to actually allow for these adaptations to happen and allow for this healing process to occur relatively more rapidly than, than otherwise. And so with that, you know, I was kind of looking for the next thing to do. I was like, okay, my body's been through it a little bit. Uh, let's, let's put the body to rest as far as sports are concerned and put the brain to work a little bit more. And, uh, and so that brought me down to UT to work in the cardiovascular aging research lab. Uh, I I'd actually just been down there. He, uh, Dr. Tanaka was just interested in BFR. Um, he, he's a, a, a Japanese, uh, uh, researcher who came to the United States about 34 years ago. And so he had some of the understanding of, of BFR and Katsu. Uh, had just had actually done a study where they were looking at blood pressure responses and um, fluidity dilation vascular function um, following a BFR session. And, and so it just seemed like a, a really nice way to kind of get introduced to the research world um, and, and be able to study this stuff. And so that, that's kind of what initiated my interest in it um, and initiated my, my journey into research in general. And, you know, uh, it, it's funny because it, with without fail, it really helped me understand the physiology related to exercise in general. Like I would always, and I think you're, you're probably, you probably do this too, but kind of putting your framework within the BFR context kind of helps me understand some hemodynamics. It helps, it, especially early on when I was just kind of understanding this stuff, uh, it helps me understand muscle physiology and aerobic adaptations, um, to exercise as well. And, uh, I just thought it was just the coolest thing ever. And, um, and then simultaneously, um, my dad was really involved in, in, in developing Be Strong and that sort of thing, had a history of, of cardi respiratory cardi cardiopulmonary expertise. Um, and so that's kind of really what got me into it. Um, and then and what ended up becoming my thesis was really um, an extension of that previous study that I mentioned that uh, Dr. Tanaka did, um, looking at there was, there was actually um, indication of ischemic reperfusion injury following this. Um, now they looked at the lower body um, and they looked at the popliteal artery, um, but there was a reduction in FMD. And, you know, our thought was, okay, uh, that may very well be the case, but is this the case in everyone? And is this the case with various protocols and different devices? Like, is, is, is this a product of using a Hokanson cuff um, that's really wide and using a very, very high pressure? Um, and so that kind of led into the master's thesis, which, which we can dig into, um, but maybe I'll just stop here and kind of, and let you chime in um, as far as like, but that's kind of how the development and interest in BFR sort of, sort of emerged. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the question then becomes what, so for those that are not familiar with Katsu. So Katsu yeah. was, is the originating device that was created, patented by Dr. Yoshiaki Sato after decades of self-experiment. I mean, again, that's how the story goes. Who knows if this is reality yeah. or this is mystique, but um, yeah. after decades of experimenting on himself and um, finding kind of similar benefits as to what you were saying about healing and, and injury recovery and things like that, Katsu is a narrow elastic band that um, that uses arbitrary units called Katsu units that theoretically, I guess, from from my understanding, equate to one millimeter of mercury application of pressure. And so that device has been the pioneering device that's been well studied in a variety of different applications, predominantly the Katsu device that I still see that gets studied is used in Japan in the, the Japanese researchers 
or um, some of the Brazilian researchers mm -hmm. that I see. I don't know. I don't see a ton of Katsu research outside of, of that or at least yeah. anybody affiliated with that. But the 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 segue then goes into which is which I'm interested in is the development of the B strong cuff as an offshoot of the Katsu device. So for those that are not familiar, the B strong is slightly different in my understanding and experimentation with it than a strict Katsu device. So I would love if you kind of talk about the 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 rationale as to the cuff design and how all of these kind of fit in to what the product is now. Yeah, and uh, that was a really great explanation for how kind of the development. Uh, and you know, on that note, before we get into that, like just a shout out to Dr. Sato. You know what what a pioneer and what a what a honestly a genius revelation that he had to get us all started on this path. Like I think we can often uh, forget just where how these things developed. And it really was just a, a classic scientific discovery out of practice. And one thing that I do want to come back to eventually is, you know, he realized this, or as the story goes, right? And I have met him, and, and this is this has kind of been confirmed by him, uh, that, uh, you know, he was sitting in that traditional seiza position at a funeral and, like, noticed, he's like, hey, my, my calf is getting pumped like I, like I, when I work out, work out in the gym as a bodybuilder by sitting in this position. And so, uh, you know, I think that's an important point to mention because, you know, we can use a band to induce this quote unquote blood flow restriction. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about, is that the appropriate term anymore? Like what exactly does that even mean? Um, but we're able to induce these states of, you know, muscle fatigue and, and reductions in blood flow or non-optimal blood flow. Um, not necessarily with bands, like with or without bands. Um, so I think that's an important kind of note to make. Um, but yeah, back to the sort of product or uh, device differences and things like that. You know, it was really my my dad's impetus, um, and he really wanted to work with Katsu on this. But they were um, they were sort of set in the, their ways of of how they wanted to do it. Um, but you know, we were able to arterial occlude um, people fairly easily um, by using this sort of narrow elastic design, and you know, my, my dad basically wanted to come up with a version that was when, when implemented to the procedures outlined, uh, was very, very difficult to occlude. And I know, I know maybe we have some, some, um, either, uh, we can have a healthy debate around like what, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that was sort of the impetus to help prevent that because the thought was, okay, if something is able to occlude and there's some masochists out there. Um, and as we know, that the BFR masochist thing is, is real. Uh, you know, people are going to take it to a level that is probably too much and, and, and give themselves complications. And so this was a way to sort of uh, with this, you know, and you use the term multi-bladder or multi-chamber. I, 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 I don't know exactly how to frame it, but it's almost more like, like so if Katsu is this a narrow elastic band that has this sort of, um, material with the inner tube on the inside kind of expanding out and in at the same time, you know, into the skin, but then also above kind of inflates like that. Um, B strong is sort of like it's elastic within a range that actually pushes into the skin with those individualized, what we call barrels. Like we kind of refer to them as barrels. Um, and by having those spaces between the barrels and having a little bit of that air within a partially elastic material allows for expansion of that cuff to an extent. Um, to, to, so there's kind of inelastic materials on the outside of the band, and then there's sort of more elastic materials on the inside. And so it becomes this sort of semi-elastic constrictive device. Um, so, you know, despite it being like, you know, a lot of the times that we get into the weeds with these things and it's like, it's just a band that, that you put on and you, you hope to be restricting blood flow in some way. Um, but it's actually a very kind of like the way we got there was very complex and with a lot of consideration around it. Um, and so, you know, and this, this kind of goes against the, um, against the grain in terms of establishing an AOP or an LOP, and then backing off from there to standardize the pressure across different people. Um, this is definitely a, a, a 
like a healthy consideration. Um, but that was not the sort of approach when it came to be strong. It was sort of like trying to minimize the risk of someone going too hard. And so this was sort of a response to, um, can we get this into the masses as a relatively safe product uh, for those who have maybe minimal knowledge about cardiovascular physiology or minimal knowledge about BFR in general? Um, and so this was sort of a, like if, if using elastic bands or resistance bands is sort of the, the practical BFR, the way I think about be strong is sort of it's, it's the practical pneumatic BFR. Um, so there is some degree of like being able to measure from day to day or measure sort of between people to some extent, although you can't do it with the same precision that you would with a wide rigid cuff, because that wide rigid cuff is actually telling you how much pressure is being placed on the limb, whereas the pressure in a B-strong cuff is really just the pressure within the band, uh, which has some, you know, and, and I think I applaud you for bringing up kind of the interface pressure, um, which is an important consideration, or the pressure that's actually exerted into the tissues. Um, so anyway, I, maybe I've gone a little bit on a, on a tangent there, but those, the, these were sort of the, the, um, the underlying issues that were trying to be addressed with the B-Strong development, um, in that way. And, and I think, you know, I think, you know, to your point, you've made a really good point of, of making a call for more standardization of protocols and devices and things like that. And I, and I commend you for that because I think that's extremely necessary, but it also doesn't mean that these things can't exist um, in the literature either. I, I just think we need to do a better job of, of like delineating, hey, this is this form of BFR, this is this form of BFR. And then once we get enough studies looking at all of it, then we can go and run the meta-analyses and, and look at, hey, um, like this is more effective for this outcome or this is more effective for this outcome. And maybe this is a more practical way to, to get, get the benefits of BFR. Or maybe there's some differences in the benefits of these two different devices. Like totally open to that and um, just eager to see where the where the research goes. One one thing to, to mention, and then I'll kind of let you chime in here, but academia is very slow. Studies take a long time to, to conduct and these things just try to slowly trickle out. So I think just being a little bit of a small small cog in, in the giant machine of research uh, is the best we can hope for. Um, so anyway, with that, I'll let you well, kind of chime in. I, I actually appreciate you contextualizing the development of the cuff and the aims of the cuff and the the implications of that design i think um i think that we're the industry is is at a space that the the i don't yeah i think we're very close so so part of what we do in our on-demand course or what we do in our in-person like add-on to our on-demand course mm -hmm. is we talk about briefly how there is a science behind how ideas spread and they tend to spread fast slowly such that <laughs> you have the innovators like Yoshiaki Sato and those are very small portion. Those are like the 1% to 2% of the population and then you start to have the early adapters. And once we get to about 15 to 18% of people that are aware of a technology or are implementing it, then we start to consider that, uh, that technique or that utility, whatever you wanna call it as, as, as mainstream. And after that hits, then there's a rapid adoption. And then beyond that, there's, the so that's the early majority and then you have the late majority and then you have the laggards these are the people that like are still using flip phones for example and even though there's iphone 58 out they're still using the the, the phones uh yeah. like that and so i think that the, the i relate this to the growth of bfr because i do think that we're approaching mainstream i don't think we're completely mm -hmm. there yet but what is very evident is the variety of different technologies that are being uh, put into the marketplace that um, are, are, are of varying different material widths, uh, you know, bladder types, as, as you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. and even features within the actual application of, of the cup itself, like autoregulation. 
And I mm-hmm. think my my position is I would I am very conscious about the safe growth of blood flow restriction. And at the same time, I also want to optimize whatever whatever ways that we can apply BFR in a variety of different patient populations. And so with with my familiarity with a ton of different cuffs on the market and what we currently know right, in, in a relatively limited body of research, but we, we do know that there does appear to be a pressure dependent phenomena such that there does appear to be a minimum amount of applied pressure that we need in order to meaningfully accelerate the fatiguing processes that occur with BFR to provide a superior benefit to the same exercise without BFR. And it appears that we, it's probably around 40 to 50%, right? The the most recent meta-analysis that looked at it um, showed that we need about 50% of AOP or arterial occlusion pressure where you you briefly mentioned it, but it's basically just getting your blood pressure taken with whatever cuff that you're using, um, which is in essence, your systolic blood pressure for that particular cuff width. It's just that it's not your systolic because the cuff widths tend to be different than a blood pressure cuff. Um, Let me stop you. I just say that's like, that's an extremely important point. I think like, like, and also, are we talking about the arm? Are we talking about the leg? Are we talking about the carotid? I mean, not, I'm not telling anybody to put it around their neck, by the way. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but like these these pressures uh, are referring to the pressure required to occlude an artery, uh, which may differ from your systolic blood pressure depending on where you're you're doing mm-hmm. it, right? And like the hydrostatic pressure is a big factor of gravity. Uh, you know, it's going to be higher in your legs than it is in your arms at heart level. And so... Um, so anyway, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to stop you there, but I think that's a really important point is that, you know, often we can, we can calculate these things based on systolic blood pressure measured at the brachial brachial artery, uh, but it doesn't necessarily reflect, uh, the pressure required to completely occlude it at all areas of the body. And then secondly, uh, 50% or 40% AOP doesn't necessarily mean 40% 40% reduction or 60% reduction or 50% reduction in blood flow to that limb. So, and I know, and I know, you know, that I'm just yeah, kind of just putting that out there. No, I mean, well, that's, but that's all. So that goes into the nuance associated with the application of BFR in general, which is we, we understand that there, there, there is some degree of a dose response between the amount of applied pressure and the restriction of blood flow, but it's not linear and it's, it's variable. I I would, I would honest, I mean, you can look at Mauser's work. You can look Mm -hmm. at the recent work with um, even Sitherlet that looked at the B strong cuff um, and show that it's not completely, completely linear, but um, there is some degree of, of pressure that will meaningfully accelerate fatigue. And the current body of evidence that we have suggests that it's, and and, in Mikkel's research, which was published in 2021 in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research that looked at meta-analyzing repetitions to fatigue between BFR and free flow, that it appears that at his arbitrary cutoff, which is really an arbitrary cutoff, he was 50% or greater versus less than 50% that we, that, right. that greater than 50% meaningfully accelerate fatigue by, I think it was 14 or nine or 14 reps, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever that yeah, variable it was, between was. Nine it was 14, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was variable, but less than 50% was only about one rep. It was like 0.9 yeah. reps, which is, which is practically insignificant. And mm-hmm. so my, my perspective on applied and 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 before we get into that, they the vast majority of that research was conducted in the lower body. 
So the yep. upper body doesn't necessarily have that. Now we do have a study um, that was in 2016. Burton Counts was the lead author, Jeremy Lemke's <laughs> lab, looking at bicep curls and showing that, you know, 40% gives the same benefit as 90%. And so we probably only need 40% because 90% elevates the hemodynamics and the perceptual responses. Right. At um, least so in the arms. Yeah. Those arms, less yeah. surface area, you know, so, so take it for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, but so if we know then that, and you kind of cut, touched on this a little bit in, in when you were speaking about the precision, but if yeah. we're, if we're looking at saying, if we agree that the minimum, the, the, the BFR, however it works during resistance exercise, right. What we understand is that there is a mean there, it accelerates fatigue. Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's just say yeah. it like that now. Yeah. Um, and we know that if we exercise a BFR and not exercise a BFR, we're going to get the same hypertrophy as long as the loads are about 20% of the one rep max. If it gets lower than that, then it kind of varies between, you know, the, the upper body and the lower body. It turns out that, that we couldn't like in the research that was published upper body, we can't make up for it, but lower body, we, you know, potentially can, as long as we're exercising yeah. a high amount of volume. Right. Right. So if we know that that's, if that's the case, then in my perspective, uh, I don't know what happened. It's a party, um, you know, it's a party pressure party in my perspective. Then if we're looking to say, Hey, this stimulus is conferring a greater benefit than the mm -hmm. stimulus without BFR, then in my, my perspective i would want to be able to prescribe a pressure that i know mm -hmm. that has been somewhat studied right we're all it's still relatively new even though there's been hundreds of hundreds of studies on this yeah it's the the, the amount of studies that have been published using relativized pressure are not nearly as much as the arbitrary. So saying like based on your systolic or, or arbitrary pressure, whatever, but just given the, 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 the growing body, although I would say limited, but it's, it's growing. It's definitely growing. Yeah. Showing, showing the role of, of pressure. Mm -hmm. I would want to apply a relativized pressure in practice, especially if I'm working with individuals that may have comorbidities or, mm -hmm. um, just in general to show efficacy, especially if I'm going to be using a non fatigue, non failure type protocol. So I guess yeah. where I, where okay. I, I struggle is, and, and this extends not just from a practical perspective, but also from a research perspective. Um, so I'll talk about the practical perspective and I'd, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts, right? Practical yeah. perspective is like, all right, well, if we know that there's a minimum sh fatigue, or minimum threshold that we need in order to mm -hmm. accelerate fatigue. I want to hit, I want to use the cuff that's capable of determining that relativized pressure. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the likelihood is I'm not going to have individuals exercise to fatigue, uh, particularly in the first couple of sessions, because that is, in my opinion, the greatest risk of BFR exercises during those Great. first, you know, one to four sessions where, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not have, especially in sedentary individuals that don't, aren't used to the intracellular um, perturbations that happen with exercise. And then you add ischemia on top of that or relative hypoxia, whatever you want to call it. And that adds to that. Yeah. So, so that's that, right. Of course you can exercise them to fatigue and see, um, but that's the practical. Then the research perspective, which you mentioned before is, when we use a non-personalized pressure, we don't know the magnitude of stress at any mm -hmm. given, you know, repetition or a person. So extrapolation of that research is relatively hindered. The external validity is, is more limited given yeah. the fact that there's, there's less precision. So I guess... Yeah. With that being said, I would I'd like to hear kind of your thoughts about how you, you know, as someone who uses Be Strong and studies mm -hmm. uh, Be Strong, how those points can kind of be rectified. 
Yeah, it's it's a really yeah, it's a really um it's a really precise question because you know, outside of us and you know, maybe a hundred other people, um, people don't necessarily care about these sorts of things, but it's, they're actually really important points. And so from, you know, like the way I can approach it, I'm sure you're the same way. Like when you're a clinician, you have the clinician hat on. When you're in research, you have the researcher hat on. When you have in your practical own training, like it's a slightly different um, effect. You're looking for slightly different things. With the practical side of things, I think this, and this is where the education piece comes in and getting certified. You know, I don't think it's, it's, it's not required to get certified and be a far to perform it, but I think it does it really helps to understand what you're doing or what you're looking for. And so if the goal is to excel it, if the goal is to get to a pressure that accelerates fatigue, I say, take a step back and let's look at some indications, subjective and objective of what that, that pressure required to accelerate fatigue looks like. And so some simple things, and you know, this kind of goes back to the Katsu days, right. Of like capillary refill time. And that's that's an imprecise way to, to see how, if you're getting a certain degree of arterial restriction, is your capillary refill time delayed? And if in like the, the kind of the, the notion back in the day was if it's greater than three seconds, too much pressure. If it's less than uh, you know three seconds or two seconds, then it's too little pressure. You know that's that's one way to gauge it. Another way to gauge it is just to make sure that you are getting arterial inflow, like check your pulse or wear pulse ox to see if you are getting a pulse to make sure you're getting some arterial inflow. And then sort of like to, to mitigate to little pressure, in my mind, distension of the veins is a big one, which you get at actually really low pressures. So, you know, it doesn't ensure that you're restricting enough, um, but that combined with skin discoloration and, and perceived effect, like, are we getting a little bit of, um, uh, you know, that pressurized feeling, and you kind of know it's kind of hard to explain without actually having doing do, doing BFR, but getting that sort of pressurized feeling in your limb, are those are those sort of subjective things that we can ask the the patient, the participant, client, uh, if they're experiencing those things, can those help inform whether we have a good degree of restriction? Um, you know, the other thing is to as a little brief caveat is when we put a wide rigid cuff on somebody and go up to an arterial occlusion pressure and back off, obviously that arterial occlusion pressure percentage goes down when they start exercising as blood pressure goes up. And so, you know, it is, it is a way to standardize it, but it's not necessarily reflective of the actual dynamic blood flow changes going on when they start exercising. Um, and so that's, that's just kind of a, a side consideration there. Um, but that's, that's, you know, when I'm training people, and, and you bring up a good point, you know, I always gradually introduce this, this stimulus into people's programs, whether they're rehabbing or, or just adding it to their kind of athletic performance training. It's always a gradual approach. And I'm constantly trying to assess these little cues that I've, that I've over years of practicing it have associated with an effective BFR session or an effective pressure to reach that point. And to scale that is hard. Like that, that's, I think, where the challenge comes into is to educate practitioners to be able to identify those signs to ensure that you are doing an effective BFR session. Um, so that, that's what I would say sort of on the practical side. On the research side, I, I think it's a little bit more important to be precise. Um, it's a, and, it's, and this comes from the idea of being able to compare across studies, across different labs, um, and across protocols, right? So if we have the same pressure, but then we're experimenting with all these different protocols and they have like some slight difference in effect, it's easier to make the conclusion that, okay, it was actually the protocol that was at play here and it's responsible for this effect. Um, and so that I do see a role, uh, a major role of, of in the growing body of literature of looking for LOP and then being able to compare that. But this is a problem I think in general in science, like um, the same techniques used to um, study different uh, structural changes in muscle um, are not the same exact same between labs and it creates kind of a cluster issue of like these aren't the same comparisons how can we really make a claim um, because you know even though they're technically looking at the same structure the same muscle biopsy the techniques to look at those things are slightly different um, it, same thing with uh, various assays uh, you know the type of assay you run it, it to be able to legitimately compare, it needs to be the exact same assay 
Um, and ideally, in the exact same research, you're performing that assay, you're performing that measurement. And it's like, at, at what point do you, you know, sacrifice that precision or ability to compare across researchers, across labs, across that th that kind of thing, and just try to sort of high level think about how are we inducing this effect of BFR? And then I think later on, you can kind of retrospectively go back and figure out, okay, well, this, this protocol, this device, this pressure led to these differences. And as I said before, it's like, it, like you said, I, I really like that. It's like a, a slow, uh, what would you say? A slowly moving fast. Uh, it's what, what well, say? adoption happens. Uh, adoption happens uh, slowly, but fast. Like, or I can't yeah. remember yeah. exactly how. Yeah, I no, it, yeah, but, but same same sentiment when it comes to sort of research techniques and things like that and measurements. Um, and so that I mean that's the that's one of the main reasons for being able to reproduce a study or a re repeat a study is in that scientific process just takes a long time. But yeah, that's what, that's what I would say is I think um, these these issues are not isolated to just the VFR world. Um, and they're really an extension of variability in how people train in general. And like, so for, for example, uh, and it's and it's kind of funny, people get really heated about uh, like these differences and and getting into the weeds and, and that kind of things as, as scientists do. Um, and, and it's good and healthy about to do that. But what's the ultimate goal here is like, at least for me, is like understanding this technology, this and the way that our bodies adapt to these various stressors, including BFR. That's what interests me. And I want to see how we can do that with a variety of things. I think this is the case in resistance training, you know, the, the high volume or low volume debate. You know, there's many ways to get there. Uh, and actually, I listened to, to your podcast with Jeremy Lenneke. He's like, there's many roads to growth, fewer I roads to strength. Phrase. I love that phrase. Uh, I, 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 I shamelessly it use it. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, and I and I, I cite my sources. So don't worry, Jeremy, if if I'm not trying to steal your your IP. Um, but, you know, I, and I would say there's there's probably even fewer roads to uh, 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 sports specificity. Right. So if if there's this giant nebulous of how to grow muscle. Many, many different ways. I mean, even even hit right can grow muscle to an extent. We can talk about the myofibular versus sarcoplasmic, but then you have fewer roads to strength, high load, you know, mechanical loading being the main main driver there. But then there's even fewer roads to being good at a specific task within a specific sport. And so, it, like for me, it's just like kind of this hierarchy and this like funneling of okay, what exactly is our target goal? Um, and now I'm really getting on a tangent diverting from your question, but what is our target goal when it comes to training, when it comes to studying this stuff, trying to get at what's going on? Um, and I think it, it applies more, applies more broadly when we talk about BFR research. So um, yeah, I think just kind of wrap up this, this monologue is um, it's really important to be precise, but it's also important to reflect what's going on in the field. And there, it's this constant like feedback uh, system where you know the field is informing what the researchers are doing, the researchers are informing what the field is doing, and then we kind of have this this back and forth kind of kind of seesaw. Um, and I think you know obviously the academic research world is going to be slower, um, and so but but it does need to reflect kind of what's going on in the real world, and um, and then we can after years of this stuff we can then tease out hey. Like we saw this result in this study because of this protocol uh, compared in this device compared to this study in this protocol in this device. Um, so it is a broader scientific issue, um, but I think it's very much it honestly it just kind of occurred to me like it's it's a microcosm of how I think about physiology with sort of a BFR lens. It's like this is a problem of physiology that we're trying to understand better. This is a problem of science and being more precise. And we're applying it in this sort of microcosm of the subset of science or the subset of physiology in blood flow restriction. And uh, it's really, yeah, it's really interesting to see all the different uh, implementations of, of that over the years. Um, so I, again, I don't know if that fully answered your question, but certainly how I think about it when when people bring it up to me or uh, ask for my considerations for for this or that. One thing that uh, I think is important to get out is, you know, there are ways to standardize the pressure to some extent um, with a B strong cuff. You know, one one hack that I have is you inflate the cuffs to about 50 millimeters of mercury. Again, not what's going on in the vasculature or the limb, just what's in the cuff. And then you put it on, you keep the, the 
uh, plug or the pump in, uh, connected, and you see how much that changes based on, on the fitting and how tight you're strapping it on. And that can give you some indication of like the fitting pressure. And then you go up to uh, go up from there to the recommended pressure or, or whatever pressure you're going to be working with. Um, so there is some way to sort of standardize it. There's some way to be, there's ways to get more precise with these pneumatic devices. Um, it's harder, I think, with a uh, elastic strap or a practical type setting, although there are ways to do that. You can do subjective ways, like right? seven out of 10. I know there's that. Um, and that has, that has been effective. So um, again, many, many roads lead to an effective BFR session, but I think teasing out what an effective BFR session looks like, both subjectively and objectively, is, is really important as, as, you, as you point to. I think, so first I, I remember what, what I said. It was adoption ha happens fast, slowly. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, and, that, that makes sense, uh, I love that. And so this, this, the reason why that came to my head is because you were talking about the, 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 the normal challenges that happen in science and it's compounded in, in, in our area because mm -hmm. we have the normal heterogeneities associated with resistance training prescriptions. And yeah. then on top of that, we have the BFR training prescriptions, and that's not even including the cup design um, right. that may have an impact on it. So it, it's multi-layer. And here, this is this kind of the impetus for me writing that beneath the cuff paper was because I'm reading a ton of research and mm. and I'm very familiar with almost every single cuff that I read in terms of what they're doing, whether it's a Hokanson, uh, mm -hmm. be strong, Delphi, smart tools, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm starting to see when we think about this, because you meant you, you mentioned it like that BFR is growing and you know, they're, they're using cuffs and, and whatnot. But my concern has been that because BFR is growing so fast, um, researchers are now very interested in BFR, but don't take into consideration that the way that a cuff is designed has an impact on the potential stimulus. And the that's really important because at the end of the day, we're using, you know, I actually refused so many meta-analyses recently to as a reviewer because I'm like, we don't yeah. need more meta analyses. We need yeah, more, we're not there yet. <laughs> we need we need more trials. Like it's yeah. it's and this is by the way coming from somebody who just got a massive meta analysis accepted, um, where it's going to be in Pure J. It's probably going to be on yeah. by the time this comes on. But where nice. we we Congrats. meta analyzed and thank you. Um, it was a it was a crazy. Uh, crazy process overall yeah, those are not um, easy so but yeah. we we met it we built upon and you're going to be familiar with this Luxandro's meta-analysis and yeah. Luxandro's meta-analysis only had 10 papers that were looking at hypertrophy um they also did strength we didn't do strength but hypertrophy and they showed that at BFR induces similar amounts of muscle growth as heavy load strength training. Mm -hmm. So we were like, all right, well, that was published in 2017. What's the most current up-to-date evidence as of late 2023, I think, 2022. Okay. And um, so we had 23 studies that were involved. And we also wanted to know, all right, well, we, we see that BFR induces similar levels of muscle growth as heavy load strength training still, but what about the rep ranges used? And so we we subdivided into failure into the traditional 75 reps or sets of 15. And what we found was is that they all induce similar levels of growth relative to heavy load strength training. So if we're in the 20 to 30 percent rep range, the likelihood is we probably only need um, we probably only need sets of 15, four sets of yeah. 15. Um, so we can get rid of the more strenuous pro pro uh, protocols. Now, with that being yeah. said, this is where it kind of segues in. It's that the, 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 the majority, or I think all of them, the studies that have been done, because there hasn't been a chronic training study in, in the sense of comparison to heavy load strength training. I'm not really, I'm not, I can't remember if early 
was 2020 the 2020 paper was was with heavy load strength training but it was to failure so i, I it, it negates the the cuff characteristics but if we're within yeah. 20 30 percent of the one rep max and we are relatively untrained because i think 20 well, only one study used trained athletes um in the meta analysis yeah yeah in the meta analysis yeah. that and we use ecological validity meaning that okay. We, we didn't standardize the reps to, to heavy lifting. These were just like, what were the authors using as a heavy load comparison? And okay. what were the BFR prescriptions? And we stratified accordingly. So we, we, we got yes. very, very similar results, five to six, five to six and a half percent of growth over a training program between six and 16 weeks. So those okay. are all things that fall very, very alignment with the research. But mm -hmm. the reason why I, I bring that up it's because those all those devices are single chambered um, mm -hmm. that we were looking at. And so when we get into adding different device features like a multi-chambered bladder system that is designed not to occlude, um, then that adds another layer of heterogeneity. So one of the papers yeah. that I actually had to write a letter to the editor on, I don't know if you ever got a chance to, to look at that, um, but but basically it was a study, it was, it was Wang and Al was the, the lead author. Yeah. And okay. they were looking at heavy lifting and heavy yeah. lifting bar and light lifting with BFR. Yeah. But the, the, the fatal flaw in that study and what, what I get concerned about as a clinician researcher is they took the B strong cuff which, which by design is not able to occlude. Then they used Jeremy Lenicky's lab's algorithm to apply what yeah. they yeah. said was a relativized pressure, which, which if you're using the B-strong cuff and the pressure that they applied, it was basically nothing. Yeah. And so my fear as, a, um, as somebody who is very invested in just the overall growth of BFR is we're getting researchers now feeling, oh, BFR is hot, but then they're mm -hmm. misapplying algorithms based upon the design of the cuff, which again, I've actually seen three or four more papers that have come out doing this unfortunate misapplication. And, yeah. and, I, and so now what is that doing? Well, that's contributing to more heterogeneity yeah. and 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 making extrapolations on the potential efficacy challenging to say the yeah. least right. and that's my concern is as bfr right. continues to grow and more and more manufacturers are entering the marketplace with different devices and characteristics that the stimulus that's provided is going to be mis you know misapplied and and that's where i'm coming from you know we we can be pretty sure that that even in even in a case where we're applying a partial non-personalized pressure using a multi-chambered system, I have no doubts that it's doing something. Right. Right. No right. doubts. Um, and I I'm on board with the the notion that as to be fair, it, it, again, looking at it from somebody who's who's who pretty much exclusively uses single chamber systems to apply B, to apply a multi-chamber system on all four limbs just seems a little silly to me, but okay. I understand, I understand that the design is such that it's not it ever, it's going to not prevent, it's going to restrict venous outflow, but it's not going to, it's going to, you're going to be able to get blood flow with a contraction. So I, I get, yeah. I get why that's the case. But just judging from the, the discomfort and the experience that I have with single chambered systems, I can't even imagine yeah. the the amount of of challenge with um with with applying it like that. But that okay. that's where I guess for me um I have my interest is how can we you know continue to grow blood flow restriction. Right. Mm -hmm. Understanding that there's going to be a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Yeah. But yeah. for me, I'm like, all right, well, what is optimal if we ever can find that out, which I don't think we're going yeah. to be able to. But it's more like, all right, what is the general consensus and going with that? Yeah. And if we get to a point. Right. And this is like my second area of interest 
right? The first interest is is for device features is auto regulation. So we're yeah, we can auto regulation bookmark study. that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I we're we're in review on our third, uh, my third auto regulation paper. Mm -hmm. Um, you know that that we're there, but my second interest is all right, what is the relative magnitude of fatigue that we can expect? So we're in now, I mean, again, when this podcast airs, it'll probably be done the data collection, but we're doing a follow-up of, I don't know if you saw the Dancy study that was published in mm -hmm. uh, arthroscopy, but we, um, that so that shocked me. And, and so I designed this study that uh because i can't carry out research is this myself. one where you're doing the, the like you're comparing reps reps to fatigue reps to fatigue with so the different yeah. with it with with so this was done uh mayo clinic and yes okay uh, i'm familiar now. i i designed the study where we looked at bicep curls to fatigue between yep. b strong delphi smart tools and yep. uh low intensity exercise to fatigue and basically just two that sets they all just two sets that yeah. they all accelerated reps to fatigue in a similar capacity. Um, yeah. I, I could not believe that. Um, it, it, that yeah. made absolutely no sense. Um, it, it made no just sense. from like your own experience with it, just with from my own experience, feeling like a wide rigid cuff, like, and just, it, it's, it's a no different, sense. it's, yeah, it it's just like it, a different level of pain kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so yeah. I, and I think that, and if you look at the data, there was a trend for Delphi to accelerate more reps to fatigue after the second set. And I think yeah. that because Maybe we didn't do more, more. Rep, we didn't do more sets, whatever. So we're repeating this um, okay. right now, and hopefully it should be published by the end of the year. But we've okay. just swapped out our design on auto, and now we're doing Delphi versus uh, the B strong applied at okay. the, uh, I can't remember what pressure we're using, whatever's recommended by the app. And, okay. Okay. um, and so we're doing wall squats. So we're doing a lower body exercise and we're seeing kind of what the differences are. Plus we're looking at arterial stiffness and, okay. uh, we're obviously, we anchored it to a low load control. So the reason why is because again, trying to figure out, parcel out what, what is the relative magnitude of fatigue differences between the different cuff ladder types, but also between the low intensity exercise alone, which is really what I care about, right? Um, everything else is kind of noise, but nobody really is doing this in the world because this is kind of like a, a nuanced, very like niche area, but it's very important because as BFR mm -hmm. continues to grow, we need to have some sort of reference point. And right now, the current body of literature that's utilizing the B-Strong, I would say half of it has been misapplied um, mm -hmm. as a relative personal, which, which again, this blows my mind too, because when you're applying like 150 millimeters of mercury, 200 millimeters of mercury with the B-Strong and you're, you're doing exercise, like that's not a lot of pressure at all relative relative to, again, my baseline, which is the the, the rigid type of, of mm -hmm. cups that may or may not auto-regulate. But like, if I'm a researcher and I'm doing this and I'm like feeling this and it's just like, wait a second, like, like it just doesn't feel like much, especially when you're applying it at such a low amount of pressure that's like even lower than what is recommended for, um, you know, by the Be Strong app, that it's like, yeah. like, I don't, I don't know. It's just hard for me to swallow yeah. that like, oh yeah, that's BFR. Like that's, that's what we should do. But that's really my challenge, yeah. right? Is yeah. how can yeah. we continue to grow BFR safely, but at the same time, recognize that, listen, like the stimulus is likely effective. How effective? We don't know. That's hopefully something that I'm going to, we're building up to. We're doing a ton of acute trials to then say, all right, well, maybe we can start to get a little bit more actual funding to conduct a longitudinal design, like a longitudinal design with auto-regulation specifically as the independent variable. That's a main interest of mine because I don't think there's going to be any difference whatsoever. The acute mm -hmm. data suggests that there's not, 
But okay. um, same I thing do, with yeah, I do want to I, I want to chat about that and pick your brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can talk about yeah. that in a, in like next. But like yeah. I also want to go for a longitudinal design that's work matched, not effort matched, and and say, all right, well, if we have an arbitrary pressure of whatever the the multi chamber bladder system would would give, but now we're doing four sets of fifteen, for example, in the in alignment mm -hmm. with our current meta analyses. And then we're doing personalized pressure at the lowest end, 50%, 60% is what we're using in our lab, 60% supine LOP. Okay, supine, yeah. yeah. Do, do we, which is another thing that I'm also interested yeah. in, which is, which we're doing right now, actually, data collection. Okay, nice. Um, so I'm really trying to, like, make my little imprint in the methodological yeah, stuff it's with, great. with applying it. But um, but yeah. I'm interested then is is the hypertrophy going to be different? Because you did mention mm -hmm. earlier, and I I really agree that the early the most of the early studies, even with practical BFR, I think can be explained just by doing more volume um, mm -hmm. in general mm -hmm. than the, an actual effect of BFR. But that's where it's going to be interesting is if if we can carry out this longitudinal design, what do we see? And ideally I would have to have three groups. It would be a low yeah. load control, four sets of 15, and then, you know, a load. single chambered and then a multi chambered. Oh, okay. yeah. right? That is the gold mine. And I'm trying to get researchers like having conversations like this, that people that have labs yeah. to be able to kind of run, because this is, this is like a massive, um, massively yeah. impactful paper. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. and on that note, I, you know, I'd love to collaborate first of all, um, we can talk after this and stuff about yeah. what, what opportunities are out there. Um, I think it's a, it'd be a really cool design, you know, you, and you brought up a lot of different things there. So I, you know, I kind of like to tease apart some things for, for one, um, something that stuck out to me is the protocols. Like, do you need to do the traditional cost of three by 30, which, you know, quite frankly, is not all that fun. Like doing 30 reps of anything is like, anyway, putting that aside, I like personally, is that I where ask you, by the way, yeah. So I was, yeah. I've been wondering, I've been wondering, because I've been seeing the three by 30 going, I, I cannot find, I, I have difficulty finding where that three sets of 30 came from. That was really from, and it might've been just a Katsu um, guideline from the available research that he had that Sato had conducted and others had conducted in Japan, where maybe it land like they were going to basically volitional fatigue or or failure. And maybe it just rounded out to, hey, shoot for 30 reps and we're gonna do three sets of that. Um that's kind of how it landed there. Um I know that Dr. Sato personally utilizes that protocol, but also other ones where it's almost like a drop set format where you're doing you know, the same, same load the whole time. So you're not dropping the load, but you're just dropping the number of reps. Um, so like you, you could do up to like six sets and maybe the first set you get 30 push ups. Second set is like 20. And then you just kind of approach that asymptote of failure as you're, as you're uh, increasing your fatigue um, and playing with rest periods as well. So anyway, that, that's kind of a separate conversation, but that that's where I think it kind of came from. Um, but, you know, personally in my own use of BFR, I'll, I'll do up to six sets of a given exercise. I've also incorporated some circuit type training where I'm doing uh, antagonistic muscle groups all within the same um, same circuit or same set. Um, but also I really enjoy the, the four or five or even six sets of 15 um, where I'm not inducing a whole lot of fatigue on the first or even second set. But by the end of the third, end of the fourth and beyond, it's like the most fatigue that that I could get regardless of whatever protocol I'm using. I've also played a lot with the time, like doing kind of interval based, even though I'm doing resistance training, just doing a given exercise for 30 to 45 seconds and then going down from there, playing with the rest periods as well, I think is important. Um, so yeah, there's, again, this, I don't want to get it too, you know, variable in terms of the conversation, but um, yeah, like these protocols are set out just like protocols for general training resistance training are set out. Like we have to land with something to make it somewhat standardized. Um, but as long as we're hitting, approaching that asymptote of fatigue, you know, I really appreciate it in the last conversation you had with, with Jeremy, like the minimal effective dose. I'm very interested in that as well, particularly for clinical populations, but also for athletes too. Well, that's, like, that's why I'm, um, I mean, the results that we have there extrapolate to the clinical populations because yeah, right. It's, you know, again, and, and well, kind of, because 20% of the one rep max, 
I there's there's nuance in the nuance, yeah. but generally speaking, that was kind of our attempt at being like, hey, like, do we really need that much volume in order to give mm. us that minimal effective dose? So for my personal yeah. practice, I have not used 30 repetitions in the first set for our data really stopped. We 2020, it was a long time. So I would okay. say over a year, I have not used in BFR practice um, with myself or with clients, 30 reps on the first set. It's always okay. been four sets of 15. And by yeah. that last set of 15, I really want to be like struggling. If not, then yeah. I increase yeah. by two and a half pounds or something like that the next set. Okay. Um, yeah. But that, yeah, that was no, that's kind a, of that's goal a great approach. I, I agree. Into, into clinical. That was the, that was really like my goal mm -hmm. of trying to get that into, you know, hey, contextualizing it. Cause I do think that. Um, there's a lot of narratives that are coming around in BFR. There's a lot of people saying things that are not backed by science or yeah. are really just leaps in logic, research, everything. Um, yeah. So it's really just trying to reduce the barrier to getting, you know, this type of, of, of training in whether you're a provider or you're a patient, yeah. um, getting that type of training yeah. in your routine. For sure. And, you know, that the, these are all really, really important points to to put out there into the world because they at, at the very least, they need to be considered like you can't you shouldn't just go blind, blindly into a study design and select these protocols because you're kind of cherry picking from certain studies and like, OK, well, we're just going to apply that thing that worked in that cuff or that device or with this population. We're just going to apply it here. There is there has to be some discussion and nuance with that design. Number one, and just to bring up that, uh, or to kind of go back to that Wang study, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what they did because to see the improvements in uh, what was it was it was it jump testing? It was, like their it, jumps yeah. went up by like twenty percent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I I'm not so sure, right? Like, and that's that's what I'll say. I don't want to say anything more than that. I'm not so sure, um, but. To take away some of the good is maybe there is something to this high load BFR and and maybe the amount of restriction, you know, even though it was very, very low, does that impede to some degree some of the normally very finely regulated and fine tuned blood flow in and out of the muscle? Did that somewhat impede that process and maybe elicit some some more tissue hypoxia that may be at play with some of those adaptations? So, you know, putting putting the results of the study kind of to the side there, I think there is a cool application with higher load uh, type type training. Um, but whether that's uh, a function of the pressure, whether that's, you know, a function of the exercise, I, I think is still up for debate um, and definitely is being considered when we're talking about study design. Um, so anyway, kind of, kind of lost my train of thought there uh, with the other thing. Well, I, do, I do want to I do want to comment because. Yeah, I, I this is where I, we might have divergent opinions because I okay. actually don't think there's any benefit to using BFR with heavy lifting. So if we if we look yeah. at and actually let me let me let me backtrack just a tiny bit. Your point about the volume is an important one. Like why why are we even using BFR in the first place? And for many applications, it's either because they can't or are in a training phase where they don't want to lift a lot of heavy weight and induce a lot of muscle soreness or muscle damage. And so that necessitates using lighter loads. Using lighter load necessitates a slightly higher volume in combination with BFR to get the results that you want. And so, yeah, to your to your point, doing a high load type thing, is that getting around the whole reason of why we're even implementing BFR in the first place? So. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think that the body of literature is so limited. I, I I I only honestly think that there's, uh, I think there may be one study, the the uh, Gilberto Laurentino, I think he might have mm -hmm. used heavy lifting, I'm pretty sure. But other than that, it's all been acute studies. But yeah, yeah. my whole thing with heavy lifting and BFR, and maybe, by the way, so so these are kind of thoughts that I've had personally, where, where I'm more open to a utilizing something like a B strong type cuff mm -hmm. if 
I wanted to lift, if I wanted to combine it with heavy lifting due to the fact mm -hmm. that I'm more concerned, well, there's two factors. The reason why I don't think that it's, it's, it's wise to do it. Number one, I have, I have a vein, a uh, collapsed vein from doing heavy lifting bicep curls with BFR. Now that's also using a, a more rigid cuff, which is the second mm -hmm. reason where I'm saying that maybe I could see a situation where, you know, you have something like in, in my, in my case, the, what I wrote to the letter, the editor on the response to the Wang paper is, mm -hmm. is that the pressure that they applied with the B strong most likely was almost like the, the, the 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 knee band knee wraps or mm. um in elbow wraps in upper body powerlifting where it was now just applied to the hip so it probably a, a allowed some sort of quick stretch and help augmented mm. what was going on um yeah. that was kind of my that's hypothesis fair. that's fair the fact that yeah. given the fact that it, they, they did see some enhancements in performance and that actually brings but, up a really um, interesting point about the pressure in general like and again, I think Jeremy mentioned this in, in the podcast with you. Is like, is there an effect of just the pressure? Like, are are, are there mechanoreceptors? Oh yeah, there's in the a skin there's um. Percentage Michelle Wilk. Michelle yeah. Wilk is, and I met him yeah. at the at a Poland the right conference. What? He's, he's out of Poland. Right? Yeah, yeah. Meathead, I love that guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and awesome. and basically, his whole goal with his lab is, can you utilize very high pressure? BFR, so a hundred percent to hundred and fifty percent during bench press and squat to help you know maximize uh, muscular power over three reps um, in terms of mm. training. So optimizing the neuromuscular features there. So there, yeah. there is, and he's had mixed results, um, but mm -hmm. there is yeah. evidence so that familiar. that hey, you can potentially do this, but. The, the main reason why and, and the way that I approach BFR education is through the lens of resistance exercise, because right. if we start to facilitate muscle, we're, we're going to tend to see improvements in vascular vascularity. We're going to mm -hmm. tend to see improvements in strength. We're going to tend to see at least looking at the, the, the evolving body of literature. We're now seeing that there is a potential impact on tendon and there's a potential yeah. impact on on bone for for whatever mechanisms that govern that. But if we look at how muscle grows, and we we think that mechanical tension is the primary driver of that growth, might not be the only might might mm -hmm. be the only one. Might not be. I don't know. Don't care yeah. that much. In my mind, it's probably the main, and then you have all the kind of like you know you have this one arrow going, and then you have all these inputs kind of like yeah, feeding you have into all it or supporting it. And, you know, for me, the reason why I've kind of in my education have moved away from kind of metabolic stress in, in mm. the sense that we do have evidence that you trap met metabolite. They don't add anything to the, the, the resistance exercise. That was actually Jeremy's lab as well. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, and, and so like do the metabolites do, the metabolites do, or well, there are capable of impeding cross bridge formation such that mm -hmm. now you're reducing muscle contraction velocity, but not at, not at the expense of, of, of muscle force production, right. uh, muscle fiber production, like eccentrics. Which demands more stress on the muscles fibers but, that, that exactly, are not exactly, impeded. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like that's, that's the impact of metabolic stress, which gets mm -hmm. into, right. There is this seesaw on my mind about how much pressure we can apply to maximize the metabolic stress, but minimize mm -hmm. the discomfort. So we're able to get mm. that, you know, it's like this hormesis effect, right? Where it's like, you get, you get a little bit and there's a great effect, but like not much more after a, a yeah. certain variable. So it's, that's where for me personally, I, I, yeah. I was the first one really uh, to publicly come out and be like, at least in my knowledge, right, that we didn't need 80% of limb occlusion pressure to to do BFR effectively. I was more along the lines of 50 to 60% pressure. And it's so mm -hmm. nice to see that the, the literature is kind of going that way. And the sure. more focus on perceptual demands and things like that. But, um, but if we yeah. get back to the mechanical tension angle, then we go back mm -hmm. to the force velocity curve with, mm -hmm. you know, heavy loads being able to produ produce high amounts of mechanical tension and high levels of muscle activation given max effort because the weight's heavy. So mm -hmm. if we 
use BFR, now we're inducing some additional fatigue that I don't know if we want to reduce the amount of volume at heavy lifting if heavy lifting is the gold standard versus right. when we're when we're look when we're lifting with light weights we need that fatigue we need to create mm -hmm. fatigue if we stop if we stop short lower lower lifting or lower load lifting is not going to induce any meaningful benefit because right. the 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 muscle activation is not high the muscle contraction speed especially if we're doing it max effort is very high it, there's just no mechanical tension mm -hmm. that's going to no significant mechanical tension that's going to be generated so those right. are kind of the the rationale as to why I, I struggle with understanding the potential benefits of lifting heavy, because if mm -hmm. we're lifting, let's just say truly, we're lifting 80% of the one rep max, which is a real like heavy lifting. It's not very sure. heavy, but it's heavy. Yeah. That's eight reps, right? right. So if we, get eight right. Reps, if we get eight reps of mechanical tension, and we know that this recent meta analysis that, were, that, that was published um, that I think the lead author is Robinson that was looking at just mm -hmm. strength training in general, that we can get a, yeah. a good hyper, hypertrophic stimulus from the range of protocols, the range yeah. of, uh, of things. Why would we want to, I guess, reduce the amount of medication, so to speak, um, mm. for our, our physiological adaptations by, by accelerating that fatigue versus in low load. We do. We we need yeah. to. It's, Huge it's difference. Right. Practical and potentially clinical relevance to be able to do that. Yeah. That's like my framework as to where I kind of see. And then obviously where I see something like a multi-chambered system um, being very efficacious mm -hmm. is in moderate load lifting. So when mm -hmm. we're doing when we're doing that 50, 40, 60. To, 40 to 60 percent, I yeah. totally see the application of of a multi-chambered system in this regard, because the load's going to be heavy. We can, we can reduce some venous uh, return. We're not really mm -hmm. creating any meaningful arterial restrictions. So the perceptual demand is going to be a lot better and we're mm -hmm. able to get a little bit more volume, but we need some more fatigue in order to get that, that physiological adaptation. So it's kind yeah. of like this seesaw. Like seesaw. Yeah. Um, that I see, you know, and where I don't see, or I see, I struggle to see is when mm -hmm. we, there is a role of pressure and we need high amounts of pressure to really get a benefit. So the acute, right. acute stages of, of rehab where load compromised, not able to do things like that's where I see, oh, maybe we need a, a single chambered system to really get right. that, that, that occlusion or I say occlusion restriction. Um, mm -hmm. going because there might be an effect of of that so it's really yeah my model that it's evolved over the course of you know yeah. now close to 10 years is a seesaw and yeah. now and it's picking like, and choosing now, and exactly and and yeah me i don't have any dog in the fight so i really could care yeah. less but it's more like all right well i have people that ask me about what about this cuff in in this situation or what am i and it's like Right. That's where I'm like forced to think about these things. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering your thoughts. Yeah. Based on what you said. Yeah, I mean, uh, you bring up a lot of good points, and you know what I would say is kind of maybe we'll start with the end and, and kind of go backwards. But I, I think the population that you're talking about also matters here, and I, I not I think you you also included that in your in your answer. But uh, you know, I think looking for that minimal effective dose in someone, especially starting out, is very important. So like going as little pressure as you possibly can to sort of gradually introduce them to this pressure stimulus and then messing up, messing with the other variables, frequency, duration, volume, intensity, um, I think can be a good way to sort of uh, help attenuate some of the maybe negative effects or negative potential effects uh, of it. Um, what I would say is I would just use higher pressures, you know, and those, those recommended pressures that Be Strong has is really a, a, a way to, gradually introduce someone to it. Um, but in reality, you know, and I typically use 450 or 500 millimeters of mercury in the, in the pump consistently. And that feels like a very, very strong pressure stimulus. I've used other devices and it's somewhat, it's very on par with that same feeling. Um, and I think it also depends on, on the context. If you are, if you are working with really, really light loads, then I think the pressure needs to be ramped up. 
Like, I think there needs to be a little bit of variation in there. If you're, if you're working with that 40 or 50%, which honestly is typically what I use, I use anywhere from 30 to 60%. And I do have a, a slightly more moderate, less intense pressure for those sorts of sessions, uh, particularly when I'm doing circuit type, type training, or um, I use the back to back to back more when I use lower loads. But another point to bring up here is sometimes I feel that low load or high load is not the right terminology. It's it's almost, it, it, I think we intensity sort of is the umbrella term that applies to both load and, you know, if we're in a, in a running or aerobic context, how literally how intense or how high your heart rate is in response to that exercise. It's, it's almost like low intensity for that person um, where, you know, someone who's in a clinical setting and can barely get up the stairs, maybe doing unweighted knee extensions is their version of low intensity where someone who is, you know, an athlete, like that's not going to, that's just not going to cut it for them. Um, so the, all these are really important considerations, um, in that. And I, and I, I do, I, I agree with your general sentiment of, um, kind of picking and choosing and which ones to insert where, um, based on your, based on your application. Um, but I think there is, you know, and, I, I sort of have a dog in the fight, I guess. I, I I would just like to see the continued expansion of blood flow restriction and a better understanding of it in general, wh whatever device that happens to be. Obviously, I, I would like to see the the family um, company and my dad's vision realized, but I'm also, you know, I, I also have, I'm very transparent about that potential bias. And um, but from a research standpoint, I really don't care, frankly. Um, and yeah, I think I think like we keep coming back to there's many ways to get there. Um, and as long as we're identifying some of the things associated with an effective BFR session, it, in some ways it's a moot point. And, you know, for the people listening and for us, it's it's fun to kind of throw these things back and forth and figure out exactly what the prescribed precise dose should be and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it is important to have these discussions. But, I you know, I think um, at the end of the day, as long as we're getting that effective session, you know, in some ways, identifying the fatigue and how many reps it takes to get to that fatigue state um, is is important. And then you can kind of go from there or, you know, use a certain pressure uh, with somebody and establish, you know, how many reps it took for them to get to fatigue. Um, all, all that is is really valuable information. But at the same time, I, I think it kind of kind of gets away from, especially for the average person just wanting to do BFR, it kind of gets away and actually turns people off when it becomes too nebulous or complicated to use. And it's like, just, yeah, just put, just put them on. Like it, you say, you say it's good. Um, I trust you, but you know, it, this opens up another kind of can of worms when it comes to what exactly we're doing with blood flow restriction. Obviously we become hyper-focused on, especially with the resistance training context, okay, we're trying to grow muscle and we're trying to grow increased strength. Um, great. Those things are very important. And I'm ex ex super passionate about that. We also have on the aerobic side, you know, are we increasing uh, peripheral adaptations? Are we increasing the oxidative capacity of the muscle? Are we increasing the oxygen carrying capacity within the, the blood vessels? Are we increasing our buffering capacity? Are we increasing our clearance? Um, and then are we also causing some central adaptations? Are we are we reducing venous return at a relatively lower intensity than venous return is reduced at, at, compared to higher intensities? And maybe that caused some functional changes in the heart, maybe long-term structural changes. Um, these are the sorts of things that we need to kind of keep keep poking and prodding to find out. Um, but I also, you know, and, and I'd like to ask you um, what your experience is with this, but it seems that whatever stimuli you're imposing just comes back to that hermetic stress. The body responds very well to these acute stressors. And as long as they're not too intense or too prolonged and ample recovery is allowed, we see benefit, beneficial adaptations um, to whatever that stimulus is. And I think that goes beyond whatever mechanical or functional stressors we're, we're necessarily placing on, which have a very specific adaptation. But I think it points to a larger issue at hand with some of the basically neurohumoral changes that are going on. And is the role of hypoxia, is the role of the drop in uh, disturbance in homeostasis, the drop in pH, um, the recruitment of these, these higher threshold motor units, is that is that coming from a neural sort of neuroplastic standpoint that is just making the individual more adaptable to other stress? You know, one, one example of this is 
uh, I think some of the earlier studies, especially with Lenneke's studies, looking at, um, they were essentially assessing strength every every like three weeks and during a BFR training training program. And so they were getting a mechanical, basically one rep max, or I forget, maybe, maybe it was like a three rep max um, stimulus every three weeks. And, but they were doing BFR and they increased strength at the end. Well, did that, did that exposure to that high mechanical load during that BFR training program have an inf have an influence or an effect on the strength gains? And I, and my, my assumption or my kind of prediction is that it certainly did. And so is there a way to integrate BFR into a program where maybe you don't want to expose that athlete or expose that person to high loads very frequently, you know, and this <laughs> to, to bring up kind of a, uh, a recently pop resurfacing popular uh, icon of Mike Menser, you know, taking basically seven days off from from the gym, like not being addicted to going in there all the time. Like, is there something to developing that those strength increases by very infrequently lifting heavy loads, but then sort of your mainstay of training is is blood flow restriction or or low loads that don't cause a lot of soreness or don't um, you know create this catabolic response um, to the training. Uh, I think it are all really important factors and variables when we're talking about the population and the protocols and and all these different sorts of things um, that I think I would love to see the research go in that direction where we're looking not only from, hey, is this growing muscle? Is this increasing strength? Is this increasing my aerobic capacity? But is this increasing my ability to, to, to adapt to stressor in general? Um, and that's what I'm really excited about. And that's I actually took kind of a, a tangent away from BFR during my PhD to really investigate intermittent hypoxia, which has some cardiovascular effects, acute and long term, um, but also has some neural effects and increases neuroplasticity, particularly in the motor neurons. And so is this hypoxic stimulus that we can induce locally with blood flow restriction, is that having a, neuro, a, a neuroplastic effect? That is then making it more it more feasible, uh, making that that individual more adaptable to other things. Um, and my my prediction is that it, it is, um, you know, and just what I've seen in both the research and anecdotally working with athletes and clients and Gen Pop, whether it's clinical or otherwise, um, it, it's almost like the whole system seems to improve. And we do see this with regular exercise, like multiple systems are, are positively affected. Um, but is that because the exercise is getting you into a state of plasticity? Because essentially the way I see it is the system goes, whoa, disturbance or homeostasis, homeostasis has been disturbed. We're clearly in a relatively unstable environment. We're having uh, low degrees of oxygen saturation. We're having uh, drops in pH, making it an acidic environment. And these things are normally associated with sort of uncertainty or instability in the environment. And is that just making the human or the system more plastic to, to respond to that environment? Um, that's really where I think is a really cool tangent away from um, or continuation of the BFR research um, and, and, and kind of a new direction to kind of aim for. Um, so anyway, I, that was a very long-winded tangent yeah. to get at what you're saying, but I, I think it, it provides some fodder for, for discussion. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in general about this, this stuff. Um, I know from a time perspective, um, we're, we're, oh, kind wow. of, yeah, we're kind of limited. Um, yeah. Do, is there any, you know, I know you wanted to briefly talk about auto-regulation and yeah. then wrap up, but what, what, kind of what has you been your experience what you know thoughts yeah um you know when i i have to be honest when i first saw it i was like why you know <laughs> i was like okay so like why rigid bfr works so like why are we why are we trying to do this auto regulation did some more digging like try to make it more comfortable try to make it less like try to mitigate the skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle pump, maybe impairment that may occur from having a, a non-elastic cuff around. Like I, I get it now. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I, I, I think why, why mess with a good thing at, 
you know, at this point. And, and I'd love to maybe maybe you can provide a little bit of background for how the auto regulation kind of kind of surfaced or what the impetus was behind it. Um, I've played with it a little bit and it, it seems to um, like I've only really done it with like bicep curls, so I can't really speak to the legs. Um, but the timing of it is interesting. Like, I think one product, what device? Is, it was the smart tools. Okay. So, and I think that one was, was the one where it adjusts based on the pressure as you increase. Is that right? Or is that the Delphi? Delphi? I, 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 I mean, I I'll, I'll, yeah, I mean, I'll explain okay. just so you can give context. But, but yeah, like product. basically as I was, like if I didn't kind of go in a rhythmic fashion, like if I was going too fast or too slow, it seemed to either not reinflate fast enough or deflate fast enough. And, and so I like, I think it could work. I just may, maybe just provide a little bit more context from you would help me kind of understand it better. Yeah. So first I actually just recently learned this um, okay. about, about the history of auto regulation and it, okay. all of this comes from the surgical tourniquet literature. So when you're, when, when in, inside of the actual, so they use the basically in the eighties, um, I believe um, this, uh, and, and it's, it's my, my long COVID brain. Um, he's, um, he's we're also going on two oh, hours Jim here. So. Jim, okay. Jim so Jim McEwen invented the automatic tourniquet. Um, and as the, I guess from, from whatever happens, like just cause you inflated to a pressure because when they're in surgery, the pressure can oscillate, especially when they're moving a limb or doing things. Yeah. So they invented the auto regulation feature to allow for a consistent pressure. Now the Delphi device okay. is a, a B, Delphi blood flow restriction device is a retrofitted surgical tourniquet device that, right. um, that they basically took that hardware or the, that software and hardware. And they basically said, all right, we're going to apply it to, to BFR now. And mm -hmm. then other devices have come on the market that have auto regulation on them. And the, the, the challenge with auto regulation is, and this comes from my, my extensive use of all these different cuffs that have auto regulation is auto regulation. It, it, and I knew this before what is the device specific feature. So mm -hmm. exactly what you're talking, what you're describing mm -hmm. was um, the hypothesis that I had secretly when I designed that auto regulation study that was carried out in the University of Ghent by Edward Jacobs, um, where okay. he compared leg extensions, fixed and failure routine. Why? Because I wanted to to see is there a difference in in auto regulations ability to accelerate reps to fatigue or potentially give them more. And my experience with the cuff is exactly what you just said, which is mm -hmm. if the motor inside of the device is small, then it's not going to be able to quickly adjust pressure versus right. other auto-regulated devices like the Delphi has a pretty tight auto-regulation function. Okay. So when you change yeah. the phase of contraction, it will quickly um, adjust accordingly, either deflate or inflate if it's the concentric or eccentric phase respectively. Okay. So, uh, so it, the, it's deflating during the uh, concentric and inflating during yes, the eccentric. I would say because okay. there's increase in in interface yeah. pressure from the from the cuff to the limb, right. so it it senses that. So, a so good okay, well that brings up an interesting point for me, and I'm sorry, I, I mean I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off, yeah. but brings up an interesting point because you know one of the things that makes sense to me is the skeletal muscle pump driving ve like basically intermittent venous flow. Um, and, and actually during peak concentric contraction, you're probably occluding. I mean, even without oh, BFR, you're, you're having these occlusion periods, intermittent occlusion. And so um, in some ways it's like, if it's auto-regulating to where it's deflating during the concentric, that's where I can see the benefit because during that peak contraction with a, with a B-strong cup, for example, like it does expand to an extent and allows for that venous flow to escape. And then... But then having a, a, a cuff that's maintaining that constant pressure, is there less venous pressure or less venous flow escaping? And, you know, is that a good or bad thing? Um, but like, I, so I'm totally, totally tracking now um, with so the, the kind the, of purpose of the auto-regulation. We have, we have, so Luke Hughes was a lead yeah. author in this paper that was, that, that it was published or 
published in a Canadian proceedings. Jim yeah, McGinnis also yeah. on that. Um, it was just showing that that the Delphi was the only cuff uh, that was able to maintain the pressure in between the the phase of contraction, at least within a second, um, okay. versus the B Strong Suji smart cuffs and what and whatever. Uh, I can't remember. What, oh, in the Saga bands, but okay. Yeah, it, the whole thing from my conceptual, we first of all, we need evidence on yeah. monitoring of blood flow and venous monitoring when we do auto regulation. So we don't have that. So it's all speculative at this point. Mm. My my kind of mental state is this is just allowing for a more consistent pressure such that we don't get we, we keep with some degree of venous venous occlusion. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it allows blood flow back in, I don't know. But the whole narrative was that that's being given on auto regulation is that it's safer. And I right. don't agree. I just I, okay. I think that it's it's something that is is a feature that could potentially enhance the, the perceptual experience of the exerciser. But do I think that it's safer yeah. than just applying it after a thorough screening process and, you know, right. integration? according to a familiarization session followed by a couple no um and right. so the the interesting yeah. thing about the auto regulation research and then we'll wrap up um after your yeah. comments on that no, and I, and I, yeah I have, I have a yeah go ahead but um we we showed that auto regulation th that with the smart tools that has a less responsive device to allow for the the constriction of of mm -hmm. flow in the e in the eccentric we found that they could actually induce 24% more repetitions to failure than the non auto regular. Oh, okay. So, so if you think about it, you kind of, you kind of touched upon my hypothesis as to what happened is that the responsiveness yeah. to the device was not good enough to keep some degree of venous occlusion going. Mm -hmm. So they were getting reperfusion with every single rep. So they were able to do more, their volume right. capacity was more. That is a problem right. from a research perspective, though, For if sure. people are using that the smart cuffs, that that auto regulation feature, but then doing work matched. Well, we already know now that on the BFR to no BFR, it's it's it, it accelerates fatigue. But from mm -hmm. a BFR to a non auto regulated, um, like the same cuff now it's a non auto regulated. Well, it's less stress per per rep, um, mm -hmm. and that might have practical application for results that we're seeing mm -hmm. we then we then said all right well let's do it with the delphi that has a more responsive device i was thinking that and we found that there in fact was no difference in performance or perceptual factors in the lower body but we mm -hmm. paired we paradoxically saw that they that the auto regulation yeah. blunted central stiffness which completely surprised me um considering mm -hmm. that low intensity exercise increased central stiffness we also don't know if 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 acute increases in central stiffness actually confer a a, a negative impact on safety may even be positive yeah you may yeah you mentioned before for example impairments in flow mediated dilatation for acute you know rigid band work but we also know that based on julie hunt's work that if you know we can have art arterial you know, adaptations happen in the same, you know, uh, way as any other adaptations, right? There's a stressor, yeah. then that they, might, yeah. yeah, then they see that, that the, okay, well, we have impairments in flow media dilatation. Okay. But then after that starts to increase over time, and then we actually have increase in arterial diameter yeah. over a period of time. It, and then it's kind of like FMD. So yeah. it's like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it is, is, is resistance training bad because, uh, you know, following a really high intensity session, you can't produce as much force. The muscle can't produce as much force. It's like, no, like, is that muscle dysfunction? No, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a stimulus to increase function later on. So, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but it, I think it's a really important point. La last thing that kind of just piggyback off that, that was really great explanation. It makes a lot more sense now in my head, um, is you know, a pet peeve of mine is like uh, the push for LOP as the only safe way to do things. And, you know, not everybody's going to be wanting to do use an ultrasound or, or, or go through all this kind of process and setting up and going to AOP and backing off. Like there are other ways to do this in a safe way. Um, so, I, you know, I think 
Um, it, there's two sides to that coin, you know, like it needs to be high enough pressure to be effective, but it, just because you're not using an AOP approach doesn't mean that it's, that it's mm -hmm. not safe. And I think where the claim for be strong is comes from, it's not necessarily that it's the safest out there because if properly implemented BFR using these protocols, it, it is extremely safe. And I, and I want to like blanket statement that th this has been used in a variety of very sick clinical populations and it's been effective. So proper, proper implementation of that is safe. It's just not the only safe way to do things. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's just something to kind of mention, um, you know, within this, within this conversation about auto regulation or not on auto regulation or elastic versus rigid, um, all these things have like slightly different effects, but they're, they're still safe. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's fair to, for any company to say that like, that's unsafe and that's safe, um, you know, within reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, listen, if, if the cuff is designed not to, not to completely, from my understanding, the application of the pressure restricts Venus or, or occludes Venus return at rest, but during mm -hmm. contraction, because of the elasticity of, of the band, it allows for some, you know, Venus outflow to occur, then yeah, inherently it, it will be more, you know, safer yeah. than a rigid cuff that's not allowing for that process to happen. I just right. get my, you know, my panties in a bunch when it's advertised as this, you know, safe. And then at the same, on the same breath, then it's like, oh, it's conferring the same exact benefits as a single mm -hmm. chambered system. When we know that a single chambered system we need a minimum amount of pressure. And again, there's nuance associated with this. Yeah, like it's yeah. more just, it's more just methodological in nature and more like, yeah. how can we refine the way that we study BFR? Because right. the way that we implement BFR might be slightly different, but mm -hmm. we need to get on the same page in terms of the expectations about what stimulus that we're applying and how that stimulus has been studied as quote unquote, you know, effective or not effective. And yeah. that's where my kind of issue lies with all of these different features and BFR yeah. application in general is we just need to have some degree of standardization and understanding that, you know, there is likely this hormesis effect that, that exists um, in the BFR space as well. But mm -hmm. how can we get to that point in the hormesis effect where we're getting the most benefit? What mm -hmm. and, and that might be biggest bang for the buck. Yeah. Yeah. Biggest bang for the buck. And for me, I'm very interested in the perceptual demands of exercise as well, because, you know, if we can get the minimum effective dose and minimize the perceptual demand that we can get people to adhere to BFR for longer. And that's that's kind of, you know, all of my interests uh, summarized yeah. in, in yeah. one um, in one place. Um, yeah. so no, and, and just to, and just to kind of wrap up here, but like, I, I, I agree with your general sentiment wholeheartedly and, you know, maybe standardization is, I think that's also important, but more like categorization, just like figuring out what we're using, how it's been effective. And then we can tease apart maybe the subtle differences. Um, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that a multi-chambered or single chambered are both effective at improving hypertrophy and strength and some aerobic adaptations. Um, the degree of restriction required for those sorts of things or the protocols might differ slightly, but it is effective. Um, but I, but yeah, I think I, I agree with you. Um, I also think that, you know, you bring up a good point and this may be something good to end on is, is adherence and feasibility. Like we know most of the population doesn't even exercise. And so one of the one of the applications of BFR that I see is like, and this is what I tell clients who are maybe, you know, baby boomer population, just trying to like stay somewhat active, just like put the bands on and just walk. Because when I know when it's like a psychological thing for me, like my non-negotiable is just like to do it like five minutes. Like if I literally am super stressed or not wanting to train that day and it's in, but it's in the it's in the program and uh, or tired, like just a five minute non-negotiable. Once I get started on that, I tend to actually have a pretty good session. And, and I think this is a lot of, this is the case for any exercise. Like once you get started, once you lace the boots up and get going, 
Uh, all those mechanisms, endorphins are released. You, you may even get an hypoanalgesic effect, which I know is another topic we may not have time for. Um, high pressures are important for that, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, you just start kind of rolling that, that, getting that process started. The idea for someone psychologically to go, okay, I'm going to start a training program. And I'm going to adhere to it. We know that adherence is low. Can the simple process of putting bands on and getting moving, can that sort of stimulate or short circuit the the system to be able to exercise um more frequently or, or adhere to more fitness type programs if we can and that that's actually a big thing like if we can reduce the time necessary for the reps to fatigue and allow people to train for 20 to 30 minutes with a proper warm-up involved in there and cool down involved in there and like a maybe a 15 minute bfr session of relatively high intensity instead of making someone train for an hour to get the benefits of exercise. I think that's a huge application. And um, that's, I think, where the real benefits of society can really come. And, you know, I love, I would prefer to be able to talk about all the nuances and devices and things like that with you is awesome. And it's like kind of a rare thing to, to be this into the, into the weeds on, on stuff. But that's what I tell people when I'm, when they're first kind of hearing about it, it's like, just put them on, walk around a little bit, maybe do some squats, and just feel that pressure and feel that pump that you get. Like, I know you're, you're a meathead like I am. And I, I just love that, that pump that you get with BFR. There's like nothing else that really compares. And I, like, if I forget my bands or something at home, like, damn it. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to have to uh, dip in a little bit more into the cost of the exercise to really get that, that pump effect that I was looking for. Um, so anyway, I, yeah, maybe just end on that positive note of, um, I think this is what the real benefit to society can be is, just an easier way to to get to a state where you're maybe more willing to exercise um and if, and if people if people the way of getting there is to is for people to think that it's doing something magical and then and then backtrack from there and like realize the the uh the reality of the situation where it is beneficial just like all exercise is um then i'm okay with that um i think any anything to get people moving and get people healthier and exercising more um, and starting that process is going to be to the good. And, uh, you know, that, then that has effects on nutrition and sleep and all the other things that come downstream from that. So, you know, my, probably my biggest bias is that everybody needs to exercise in some capacity. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I maybe end with that. Yeah. I, I think, I think in this podcast, we found a ton of, of mutual ground, Absolutely. that um that we both are are very much exercise enthusiasts and this is bfr is a tool that we can use mm -hmm. to hack our body systems whatever we want to think about it and yeah. there are nuances associated with its application whether they matter or not is up for debate but at the end of the day we have an exercise obesity crisis people are not exercising enough i think the last time i the last thing i read is only 25% of american adults sure. reach both aerobic and resistance exercise guidelines something like 40% i think are aerobic only and 20 something percent are just resistance only so it's it's trying to break down those barriers and and BFR may be a solution for for that um, for that to get people going at least to mix it up a little bit and and yeah. get training somewhat exciting. Um, so with that being said, what what do you have in the pipeline for for you as as a researcher and um, any last you know plugs that you want to make? Um, feel free. This is your time uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, uh, don't don't take too long. We have some interesting um, studies uh, currently in the grant um, development process. So very early on, um, looking at combinations of intermittent hypoxia with blood flow restriction. There's a group in Lausanne, Switzerland, who have who have combined hypoxic exercise with uh, with BFR and seen some pretty interesting effects, um, particularly related to aerobic adaptations. Um, so that's that's something that we're looking to investigate in a in a more tactical type population. Um, period, periodization of BFR is really interesting to me. So, you know, using it during a deload week, if you do, if, you know, this is healthy populations, what we're talking about here, um, going through a resistance training program, then, you know, it, the effect uh, or like taking a deload week or 
having a week of travel where you may not have as easy access to these things, can you implement a VFR uh, program um, and help at least maintain or maybe even improve or create slightly different adaptations during that time? Um, both those things are sort of uh, in the pipeline uh, for us to look look at. Um, they're going to take some time. They're going to be training studies. So, uh, you know, don't hold your breath for too long. These things take time. But um, that's kind of where that's kind of the path that we're kind of going down. Um, really interested in the neuroplasticity aspect of things. Um, there's some maybe certain serotonergic pathways that are involved there or even um, BDNF pathways that may be at play. Um, and I'd like to like to investigate that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, you know, no, no plug to speak of. Um, you know, I, I kind of have like more private social media stuff, but I, I created a, a Dr. Stray Gun uh, Instagram account that hopefully I can kind of take off here. People can find me there and really, and you know, I'm not trying to promote anything, honestly, just not even trying to push one thing or the other. I just, I, I just want to share this kind of journey of striving for excellence in science, striving for seeking knowledge and having these kind of conversations with people who, who are passionate about it too. You know, it's, again, like to kind of maybe circle back to the beginning of this 10, 12 years ago, you know, everybody's kind of laughing at, at you for bringing this stuff up. Uh, not you, like at, at people who were talking about this and it's just, well, they were you know, laughing at me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they were laughing at me too. I remember I have a very uh, visceral memory of like doing a barbell curl with, with bands on in my college SNC gym and, um, kind of like seeing my strength and conditioning coaches kind of like snickering in the corner, um, like, like, look at this guy, you know, doing that. And I'm like, well, you know, uh, you know, being on this side of things now, like there is, there really was something to it. So um, that's, that's, that's like, that's nice. Um, it, it's, it's been a, a cool journey this, thus far. And I'm just excited for where this stuff takes off. I think there is still a lot of skepticism around it, despite, you know, the, the growth of the research. So um, yeah, still a lot to come and, um, you know, happy that we're kind of inside of it all and able to have these conversations. Yeah. Well, cool. everyone who's made it to the end of this, thank you for listening yeah. and I uh, hope to catch you next time. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.